Hey guys, welcome back to the Map Brown show. Today is going to be yet another cracking installment, I hope. Don't fuck this up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you haven't heard, or you've just heard, but his name is Albert Van Veek. Albert, welcome to the show, bud. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Here comes your coffee with a smile. Thanks, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Just don't knock everything over. <laughs> so, Albert, um, I guess how I was introduced to you was that, um, you know, you're a millionaire at the tender age of 22. Well, you were a millionaire. Still a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, today being 26, but um, but that's kind of the, the positioning around this whole podcast, which is how do you become a millionaire at the mm. tender age of 22? Come on in, Chris. Yeah, it's pretty pretty laid back here. Um, yeah, so, but before we get into the, the meat and the potatoes, like, mm. it's quite a cool story, mm. you know. Um, also, I think it's quite interesting in the sense that when you're young, it's what you want. You know what I mean? You want, to, you want the money. Yeah. It's like you're not all about contribution or anything like that just yet. <laughs> yeah. you, you, want the, you want the toys or you want the bike that no, you can't have and your friends have. And I think that's what, you know, drives you to start doing these things. And but where did you get your entrepreneurial, like, spark and passion from? So I didn't grow up in a house where my parents were business owners or entrepreneurs or property investors or whatever. So I think it started for me when I was 10 years old. And I couldn't get the bike that I wanted for my birthday. That's got to piss you off. Really? And, and <laughs> I mean, we went to the store. I yeah. saw the cool bike and yeah. we couldn't afford it. I had to take the entry-level bike. And what really pissed me off is the next year when I got to school, uh, my birthday was in December, January when I got to school, the cool kid in the class had the cool bike. That's really got to piss and, you off. Uh, <laughs> and I, I parked my bike next to his every day for motivation. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that's where, thank you so much. I think that's where it started. Because mm. then I start asking questions. Why don't I get pocket money? Why can all of my friends buy at the tuck, sh tuck shop, but I can't? Mm. Why do I only get a, a, a gift or a toy on, on my birthday? Why can't I get toys when my friends get toys? Mm. And I start asking these, these questions. And I started you know, asking my dad these questions the whole time. And he said, you know what, Albert? Not a millionaire. I cannot teach you how to become one. If you want to become a millionaire, you need to learn from a millionaire. Hmm. And then he gave me my first book. And I started reading my first book. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. No, so it was actually a John C. Maxwell book huh. about leadership and a bit of finance. But then obviously it went to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, uh -huh. and I started reading the next book and the next book and the next book and the next book. And I think that's where that whole entrepreneurial spirit or drive started. Mm. Okay, cool. So there you are, um, not able to kind of afford the bikes and things that you wanted and so forth. And so you went in a bit of a learning curve. Uh, walk us through like what what was the, the idea? Like where did it start? Was it the traditional like you know lemonade and <laughs> lemonade and and uh, lemonade stand lemons and lemonade whatever? Was it baseball cards? Like yeah, what was so, it? So something similar. When I was in primary school, we had these strings called Scooby Doo's. Okay. Don't know if you can remember it. Yeah. You could weave it. Right, so you're getting lots right. of nods of appreciation. So, what the fuck? So, what is a Scooby Doo? It's a it's a plastic string. What? Yeah, it's a, wire. a plastic string, and then you weave it to make a keychain, and then you have all different ways of weaving it and stuff. It's beyond me. So before so, my time. So all of the kids wanted this. I told my mom, please take me to Macro. I bought a few. I sold it at school for a fifty cent markup. I did that a few a couple of times, and then it started turning into a whole toy shop. So I was selling club what? guns, slime balls, really, yeah, you know, all of these Chinese toys that you get. <laughs> uh, uh, I was smelling, uh, selling it at school, and then the kids started lighting the smoke bombs and the pops and stuff at school. So my my principal said, "Oh, but you can't sell toys at school." And then I stood outside the school gate every day selling toys to as the kids came out of school. <laughs> so um, it it was a big toy business, and. Um, yeah, I started mowing lawns, washing cars in our neighborhood, cleaning rooms in our neighborhood. So mm -hmm. I got 10 rand for a room that I cleaned. So I went to people in our neighborhood, cleaned their rooms, washed their cars, mowed their lawns, and made money like that. Wow. And, and then when I got to high school, it just got worse. Like, you know that, <laughs> you know that guy that you had in school that sold everything? Like yeah. that one guy that you can get anything from? I was that guy. So I like sold, anything. I sold... <laughs> 
like PlayStations, how much was the bag? Like, uh, <laughs> TVs, you know, whatever. I was selling anything I could get my hands on. I would used to, when we visited friends of the family, mm. I would walk through the house and we'd look at all of the things that they had and I would be like, are you still using that old vacuum cleaner? You know, that old bicycle there. <laughs> And then I would say, what if I can get you a thousand bucks for that? And I would take it, sell it for 2000, take my cuts and give them the thousand for the thing. Uh-huh. Because they were like, oh, it's all, what? Can you get money for it? You know? Mm, yeah. So I was selling all kinds of things. Um, in high school, I also started a music school because I could play a little bit of guitar, taught my friends how to do it, s- employed them to teach other people how to do it. So it started with like one or two kids coming to our house. <laughs> is this guy <laughs> coming to our house one or two kids coming to our house for guitar lessons changed into a music school with th- hundreds of kids coming for class that i didn't even know um <laughs> made money from that uh yeah and then in school i also like public speaking a lot so when the teacher said yellow more is the mondeling you know yeah. public so everyone was like no we hate public speaking i was like yes and then I stood outside the classroom door and said, 30 bucks, I got you covered. And, you know, I, was, I was writing speeches for everyone in class. And uh, the next day when they came in, everyone who paid 30 bucks uh, got, got a speech and they were, they were sorted. Wow. Okay. So, You're a proper so, yeah, hustler, dude. That was, that was like primary school, high school. I started renting out matric farewell cars in high school. Uh, I saw the matric students. What? Wait, wait, wait. You started renting out matric, matric farewell cars. So the matric students oh. wanted cars to okay. go, like an old vintage car, whatever, to go to the matric farewell with. <laughs> and I knew my grandfather had this old vintage car in his garage. He always moaned it was never being driven. So I said, you know, Grandpa, I'll drive it for you. Borrow it to me for two weeks. And for that two weeks, I rented it out for matric farewells. <laughs> and then I bought the next one and the next one and the next one. And before I knew it, I had five cars doing 20 to 30 matric fa- farewells a year. So what? That, that, was, that was high school. And then I went to university. That, that's, that's <laughs> n- he's not even in high school at this point. <laughs> what was I doing in high school? Sonal's mind's just blowing up at the back there. <laughs> so... When I got to university, I still had the matric farewell car business. Then I started buying and selling cars. So I was trading cars. Um, I started construction uh, yes. business. So, so in high school already, I started painting some fences and some walls and stuff. And then when you painted the guy's wall, you notice a few cracks. And you're like, why don't we fill this up for you? And that turned into building walls, you know, and stuff. So construction and those type of things. Um, Second year, I noticed that all of the third year students wanted uh, some money and all of the second year students wanted the new books. So mm. I made sure I was on the second year WhatsApp group and third year WhatsApp group and I would literally arrange them at the same spot. So I would go on the second year WhatsApp group and say, hey guys, who wants next year's books? And I would go on the third year WhatsApp group and say, hey guys, who wants some cash? <laughs> and then I would <laughs> stand at one spot and the second year would come up to me, give me the money, I'll take my cut. I'll pay the third year for the book, take the book and give it to the second year. Just like that. (laughs) Selling books at university and things. Um, Yeah, so at 19, I was able to buy my first property with the money from the businesses and all of these things. I ran that property as a commune for four years, um, generated a lot of income from it. And at the age of 22, four years later, I was able to call myself a millionaire. Wow. Amazing. Round of applause here. That's like the definition of hustle. And I think the, the, the message that I just want to get across there is it can start with a little plastic string. string. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where selling that for a 50 cent markup. It's amazing, man. And if you just keep going and you learn those lessons, read the books and mm. stuff, then mm. you can do it. So, I, like, uh, that's really cool. I love that. I mean, um, you remind me of um, the guy, uh, Richard Rawlings. He found a gas monkey. Mm. So, he started when he was... 50 years old, right? Which is interesting. So you did it really young, but I mean, he, he, he wasn't who he was at all when he started at 50. And, um, and he literally did the same thing. He was like, he, he hustled his ass off. Like he literally did anything and everything to make cash. So when he was young, you know, so he, he always had it just like you did, I guess, when he was very young, but like he, he kept all the cash in a shoebox. And one day his okay. dad came to him and said, like, you know, he saw all the money. He goes, dude, that that's more money than I make in an entire year. Yeah, you know what I mean. But where, what's the question on your on your mind 
like when you think about all the different things that you that you did to make your mm. first bar, what was the one question on your mind or running through your head at that time? Uh, well, I, I would say an, not necessarily a question, more an ambition. Mm -hmm. So when I was in primary school, it all started, it was about a bike that I couldn't have, right? But then when I got my bike, it changed a bit because my dad used to go out early in the morning when it was still dark, come home late at night when it was already dark, just he had a tough job and he, he had to work to put food on the table for us. So I think for me, it, it changed when I was reading these books, which dad, poor dad and stuff and sawing my dad working so hard. I thought that, you know, I want to live a different life. I want to be financially independent. Mm. And I think that's, that was the, the question or, or the drive more. How can I get to that point to become financially independent before I have to go mm. early in the morning, late at night, work my, my ass off for just nothing almost, you know, mm, so. Mm, mm. And, um, and, uh, did you fail a lot in that time? Because it just seems to me like you hassled and it all it all kind of came, came together, which isn't exactly true, right? No, so. there were so many businesses that, that didn't work. For example, uh, my brother uh, plays Dota. I don't know if you know the game. As in D-O-T-A. Yes, so okay. it's a, so it's an online game. It's a it's a massive, like a lot of people play it. And I wanted to buy him one of, one of the figurines or one of the characters, and you couldn't find like anywhere. So... I said, well, we don't, why don't we make one? So we, uh, I got a sculpture to sculpt the whole thing and we started a molding business. So we were literally taking this sculpture that he made and we molded it and we produced like over 200 of them and painted them and, you know, paintbrush and everything, boxing. It was so cool. We had a little caravan at the back of our yard and I called it our meth lab. Because it looked so dodgy, because of the molding process, you had to add on gloves and a coat and like all the you uh, know, stuff. Like it looks like a chemical, like Breaking Bad, basically yeah, type of vibes. And it was a little <laughs> caravan, you know. So it looked dodgy, but um, we produced a lot of them, uh, sold a few of them, and basically the the business didn't take off. Uh, lost, mm. lost uh, at that stage. It was like university. It's lost about fifty k or so, but mm. you know. Um, so that's got to hurt when you that. Yeah, yeah right? when when at that stage when you're just starting up, that at that stage it was a lot of money to lose, but uh, a lot of businesses, yeah, mm. that didn't work. Mm -hmm. But you get the ones that work, and then you go for it. So at, at the same time, I started a business called Gazaru, where we do the online media, so basically design work and social media and branding, and that I still have today. So it worked, you know, it just kept on going with it, mm -hmm. and we still run that business now. So what do you do now? I mean, because it would, it, because there was probably like I don't know, twenty five different uh, startups in that little or like <laughs> little hassles or plays there. Yeah. Um, have you kind of like consolidated and matured down to maybe a handful? And mm. uh, what are those? And and maybe walk us through why. Uh, so, so three, so three, I've, I've downscaled to three because the why, the reason why you have to downscale is because you can't spread yourself so thin. Mm. It's just, uh, impossible. In 2016, I used to be on site. Then I would drive to the office to quickly do something there. Then I would drive there for, to a school or something. Then I would be back at the site and then I need to go to another site and then this business and then that. Many, it's just terrible. Mm. So. Mm. Um, I have three main endeavors now. So the first one is the property. So I have a few buy to let, uh, buy to let properties that I bought and renting out to students. And then I have my development projects in property where I buy houses, renovate them, um, and sell them again. So basically flips. Uh, so that's my property leg. And then I have Gazaru where we do the online media. That's, that's my business leg. And then we have Millennia 22, which is a, is more of a passion project mm. to, to give back to the youth, to, mm. to teach these concepts to the youth. And we travel across the country, visit schools, you know, do corporate talks and stuff. So that's the three things I'm, I'm currently busy with. Cool. I'd love to talk to you more about this book. So here it is. Um, how to be a millionaire 22 aptly named. <laughs> um, and, uh, but what's the book? like about is it you know if if for those of you who haven't read it or heard about it um what's what are you trying to get across here so it's basically telling my story mm. of how i did it sharing these these stories with the people that read the book to show them 
that it is possible. Mm. A guy coming from the Muet in Pretoria can do this, so you can too. And then I share tips on you know how you should think, changing your mindset a bit, how to start actioning things in your life, um, and then goal setting and all of those things. And then I get to money, what to do with your money and how to use it and stuff. Mm. So initially, the target market was ages 16 to 22. And initially, my goal was just to make a difference to the youngsters. Hmm. Uh, but then when the book got out there, like we got so much feedback from all the people, let's say 45 up even. Hmm. Um, I mean, I had, a, I had a guy that was 67, I think, that read the book, took a lot of value from it and, and started his own business at that age after retiring. So I, I, think, hmm. I think the book made a massive difference over a whole, you know, age group, not mm. just, not just the youngsters, but that was, that was the goal. And, and that is how it's written. Mm. Well, I commend you on that, dude. I think it's important to give back at mm. any stage, at any stage, even if you're not, you know what I mean? You no. get, look, if you have a business that's six months old, you're doing something right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so start giving back, <laughs> I would yeah. say. But, um, but I mean, let's talk about mindset because it's an interesting one because your mindset was, um, I think in Rich Dad Poor Dad, he, or at least maybe it's um, commonly known as like a poverty mindset, mm. you know, where, and I, I, I think it all starts with the operating system of your mind. So the book that I've got, my book coming out on in, when is it? Uh, Mid July. Awesome. And, but it's about, it's about, it's like, it's the mindset, you know, it's mm. like the mindset of can versus can't, victim versus victor. I'm not saying that that's what I write about necessarily. Mm. I'm trying to, you know, summarize the, the idea behind mindsets and, you know, what creates the spark to, in your case, it was the bike, right? Mm, but the yeah. bike, that, that event led to a change in mindset. And that change in mindset led to the action that then created the financial independence that you needed or that you wanted. Did you buy the bike in the end? Yeah. Or so did I, you just buy something more expensive? First, first year in high school, um, I got my bike with the hydraulic brakes and the, all of the nice okay, fancy stuff cool. that it had. So, so let's talk about mindset. Like in your, I mean, you write about it in your book. Mm. Walk us through what, what's the mindset that uh, an individual, let's just say anyone listening to us right here, right here now, like Q here or Mav or whatever, like I encourage them to work for themselves one day, you know, mm. everybody should. But what's the mindset shift or mm. sort of requirement that one needs? So the thing is that, and, and this is what I call the biggest secret to becoming a millionaire, because mm. everyone asks you, oh, what's the biggest secret? What's the silver bullet? Uh, now, there's a lot of elements to it, but I think the one that stands out to me above all of the rest is that you need to think like a millionaire. So, so that's the thir first thing. The first mindset shift is to understand that, hey, I'm not thinking right. Because everyone thinks that we think the same, but we don't. Uh, that millionaire or that billionaire or that top property investor or that you know, top CEO thinks differently than what you are currently thinking like. And you, if you want to become that person that you want to become, you need to think like they think. Mm. And I think that's the first mindset shift. And then the obvious question is, how do I think differently uh, with, with my mind? And then in my experience, content. Mm. You need to take in content, the content from those people. And then you can pick up how they think. And that content fills your mind. And it changes the way you think because it changes what you think about mm. and therefore it changes what you focus on and therefore it starts changing what you see. It's, it's just like your favorite car. What's your favorite car? Uh, Ferrari 458 Spider. Okay, great. Boom. Good choice. <laughs> so mine is a CLA 45 AMG. It's, Much it's more the conservative, next one I, but just want to, I want to get. Um, so it's an old man's car, Brie. Why so, do you want to drive that? <laughs> so when I drive on the highway, there's a thousand cars passing me on the left-hand lane. I can't remember their brands. I can't remember their colors. I can't even remember seeing them. Mm. But as soon as that Ferrari passes by, right, you immediately see it. Mm. Why? Because that's what you're focused on and that's what you see in life. Before I started buying property, I always saw the green grass and the nice houses and the rabbits and things. I never saw for sale signs. As soon as I started buying property, I can literally not drive anywhere without seeing for sale signs. Hmm. They're, they're literally everywhere. So I think that shift starts with understanding I need to change my thinking. And how do I do that? By taking in new content, listening to podcasts like this, reading books, hmm. um, watching YouTube videos to fill your mind, to think 
about different things and start focusing on different things. And then you start seeing different things. You see opportunities that you've never seen before and you see ways to increase your wealth that you've never seen before. So I think that yeah. is what I would suggest. Okay. So it's like, it's like um, if, you, if you make the assumption that the human mind is pretty much like a computer and, so, and it's crunching information. So if you put shitty information in there, like I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, I'll never be rich or whatever, or um, to your point, thinking like a, a millionaire, right? So you know, how can I add value? Mm. Or there's value there. That's an, un what is an underserved market? You know, whatever the case is, yeah. it's like to your point, content or information, uploading that shit into your brain. <laughs> mm. uh, and, and, you know, to your point and absorbing that from people through books, through research, whatever that is for you. Mm. Podcasts even is in this case. Mm. Thanks for listening guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, exactly. But, I mean, it, it just changes the way you see the world. And I get so many people that say, I want to be a millionaire mm. or, even business owners, when I do talks in front of like 200, 300 business owners, I ask them, how many business books have you read? And when it's like, who has read one business book? Everyone's hands are up. But when you get to 10, mm. 15, 30, it gets real quiet. Uh, and, and I think so many people say, is, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a great business owner. But they don't take in the program. If you want to use the computer, now, they don't take in that programming mm. or that new information that allows them to do that. So they, so they look at content that is irrelevant to becoming a millionaire or business owner. Yep. You need to take the content in that is relevant to who you want to become. Mm -hmm. um, where does one start with that? So let's talk about books firstly. So what, what's been the most influential book in your, in your life so far? So I would say the, the first one was Rich Dad Poor Dad because mm -hmm. that's, that's where I started, Robert Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, a, a massive influence, surprisingly, I didn't think that it would have, uh, is The One Thing by um, Gary Keller. The one thing by Gary Keller. The Kelly. one thing. So it yeah. completely changed my whole mind about time management and, and goal setting and, and how I do my daily things. So, so those two books are great. But then normally I suggest as a startup, read Rules of Wealth from Richard Templar. Uh, read How to Win Friends and Influence People from Dale Carnegie. Yeah, I read that. Uh, read Start with Why from Simon Sinek. Uh, those are all great books to start mm. with. Have you read a book called Niche Down? No, I haven't. Uh, play bigger no uh, christopher lockett is coming on my show <clears throat> he sold his company to i think h hewlett packard for like a billion dollars or whatever um but um but those two books more most recently have been super influential on us because mm. i mean we we've niched down in the tech sector and you know we, we we are we've i'll send you the 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 details after but um um but, uh, you know, we've quadrupled in size in six months simply by niching down. You know, a yeah. lot of the product stuff that we that we take to market, the lightning strike, um, came from Play Bigger, which is all about category design and how do you create stuff that you own or market mm -hmm. segments that you own. Um, that book there also, The Paths to New, um, I forget the author now, uh, Jean-Marie Drew. He's the uh, head of or chairman of TBWA Disruption. So their whole thing, one of the biggest ad networks in the world and uh, based around, you know, disruption and culture. Um, and how do you spot, literally, how like there are proven scientific ways to disrupt markets. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, which is an interesting point of view. So take property. Mm. You know what I mean? Like uh, Scott Pickin and Wealth Migrate, they're disrupting the property sector. But how do you get to the idea? And, you know what I mean? If you read this, and then you start thinking about how do I disrupt this mm. the whole day? And then you start seeing these things and ways to do it just because you were thinking about it and focusing mm. on it. So talk to me about your decision making process, because mm. for me that, you know, especially now, if you're in a technology enabled business like us, if you make a bad decision, everything's 10 X bad, but if it's good, it's 10 X, 10 X good. You know what I mean? Mm. So like you could literally wipe out your business if you have a hundred K versus making like a bar, you know what I'm mm. saying? So decision-making really matters. And often I, and the reason why, I mean, I've started nine companies and six of those failed. So I know very much what failure feels like and it sucks. Mm. Um, it's also necessary because what it was what was necessary about that was the fact that, you know, you learn how to make decisions properly. You know, and like, whereas before I wouldn't have a risk radar, <laughs> it would just be like, kind of like what I imagine you were doing, which is just like, let's go and start all these different things. <laughs> and then now you've, as you said, you've consolidated down into three because you've learned mm. that you can't run all these different things. You know what I mean? There's a means to an end to it. Mm. Um, 
what have you learned about decision making? How do you make decisions? Are you looking at data points? Are you looking at intuition? Is it a mix between the two things? Like, how does one, in your case, how do you specifically make decisions to ensure that you have the most probability of success? So, so one of the big, I like to be a hands-on business owner. The reason for that being is I like the gut feeling that, that something gives me. So, so maybe I'm not that analytical about the decision, but if it gives me a good gut feeling and, and I think we can do it and we can pull it off and it feels right to do it, then I'll get into it. If it, if, if I get a feeling that, uh, maybe we should not go into this, I get a, a bad feeling then I'll rather stay away. I won't even try to force it. So, so I think trying to force things, sometimes there's a good opportunity, but you're going to have to really do stuff that you don't feel is the best way to go and you're forcing it. Then, then you, then in my case, it always led you to, to a failure. But if, but if you went with the, with the gut feeling and you felt, yes, we can t tackle this. Mm. We can do this. This feels good. I think it's going to be a, a good, a good road to go on. Then, then we'll take that decision. But a lot of my decision is also uh, based on, uh, how I juggle all of the balls that I'm busy with. Um, so another lesson my dad taught me is, yeah, if you, if you have a, if you have a ball and you're juggling a ball and you throw it up too early and it falls, or if you hold one too long, the other will fall. And if one ball falls, you have to stop juggling all of the balls and pick it up and then you can start juggling again. So it's very important to make sure that you keep, you know, your hand on, on a ball just long enough to get it back into the air. So a lot of my decision making is based on that as well. How much time do we have to spend on this, uh, that we want to uh, tackle? And what is the result that mm. we're going to get? Um, are we going to spend, 80% of our time on this and get 1% of the result? Or is there something else we can do to, to, to get a better result compared to the time that you put into it? So like opportunity cost, basically. Yeah. Okay. And then um, what, but you, but I'd like to get into a little bit more detail around like when you say you, you get like a feeling, like your gut, like what is interesting, right? Like if someone doesn't know what the hell you're talking about or mm. what we're saying, like, you know, well, you've got to trust your intuition because you get told that a lot, right? Mm. It's like, no, you got to trust your intuition. Just follow your gut. And oftentimes that's a lot of bullshit in the real world. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But let's assume that it is viable. And it's, I'm not saying that it's not viable. I'm saying sometimes, yes. Yeah. It's like, it was weird this morning. It's like, you know, dude, because I got a meeting with an investor in about half an hour. Um, and I'm like, so, so let's just say I meet with this investor mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, cool. You know, um, it just went really well. The company's putting money on the table. It can help us scale and whatever. Mm -hmm. So now I'm sitting with a decision. So now, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? I so now like, decide. so do I like, do I meditate and go, do I, do I feel good when I say his name? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, mm -hmm. or do I, does, do I get it? Do I get a jump or a lift or do I mm -hmm. just feel bad? Or do, mm -hmm. is it, but then is it fear? You know, because yeah, that's also mixed if, into if it. Is it you? Risk or, yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? So, mm. so what are kind of what are some of the like the the metaphysical signals? I guess that that you would look yeah. out for. That's hard analyzing myself like that. Um, I, I read a book. I'm busy reading Shoe Dog as well, and and Phil. Why do I know that name? From uh, Phil Knight. He, he uh, tells the story of Nike. Oh uh, yes, that's they it. They had the there same kind of. They had to decide if they want to go public. And every time they said, no, it doesn't feel right. But I, but I, I'm thinking about how I go through it. I think if you're going to tackle something, if you're going to go with something, you really need to be excited about it. You need, really need to feel energy around that. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, when the going gets tough, you're just going to jump out of it. You, mm -hmm. You're not going to pull through it. So, so whenever you don't feel that intense it's weird to describe it like mm. that drive or that energy to, to do this. You're it's really like excited. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can't sleep at night. You think about this, that company that wants to buy in. You Google them all the time. You check out everything about because you're very excited about it. Mm. Um, and, and if that is the case and if you're passionate about it and excited about it and it makes you curious and it makes you, it gives you that energy, then obviously when the going gets tough, because on this road, there's going to be a few things that's yes. going to be like, Oh, you know, and, and, and when those tough bumps in the road come, you need to still have that energy mm. to get you through it. Because otherwise, when it comes and you've been feeling since the start, like, mm, maybe I don't want to do this. When the first bump in the road comes, you're going to be like, uh-uh, 
no, this is a failure. I'm getting out. Mm. And most of the times, uh, some of the failures in, in, in my life with the businesses and things is just because I didn't really have that intense excitement or passion or energy to make this thing work. And then if I look at my business that I have now, we went through tough times. There was a lot of times where it was terrible. But what made us a success is the fact that we had that energy. We had that drive. We had that passion to make it work. Cool. I wholeheartedly agree with you. The thing that like, I'm thinking now, it's like the only time I would get excited ever about like a financial gain or investment would, no, a financial gain in any way would be in state. Yeah. Like it would be when it's done, the story's done. You know what I mean? Like it's sold, it's done, or it's been handed over or whatever. There's a legacy left behind. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't actually think I would ever take money. Like really. I don't know because I would be too, I would be too unexcited about mm. what that would represent. Mm. Makes sense. Now I'm working for someone else. Now yeah. I've got to hit like 10 X or 20 X revenue. Mm. Now I've got to crush my team on, on delivery. You know what I mean? Not that I don't do that, but anyway, um, <laughs> but I'm saying like, it's a different ball game now. Cause yeah. it's not, it's not even your business anymore. And sometimes you need to decide what you want as an end result in life. Mm. Uh, like with, with my business guys, Rue, we scaled up. And when we got there and we had so many staff members and stuff, I realized that this is not the type of business that I like. This is not the type of business that I really want to run. Mm. And I scaled down again. Uh, for a while, I didn't want to go to my own office because I didn't like the vibe. I didn't like the, really? the energy. I, I wanted to stay at home. I, I would rather book more days at home than at the office because I didn't like what was going on there. Mm. Uh, and then when I scaled it down again, I can't wait to get to the office. The energy is different. My my excitement about the, the business is better. And I think sometimes you need just need to decide, is it always better to scale? Or is it is it better to downscale? You know, mm. where what type of entrepreneur are you? You get the entrepreneur that's Elon Musk that wants to go to Mars, right? Mm. He needs fifteen fifty billion dollar to get there. And then you get the entrepreneur that just wants to go fish every day. Mm. And and he needs to generate a little amount of money to buy bait and mm. petrol to get to the to the dam where he can fish. Yeah. So it, it depends on where are you on the scale in 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 your part of your life where you are right now. Maybe ten years from now I'll be like, yes, now I want to build a billion dollar company. But at this stage, you know, this is what I want. And 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 maybe downscaling is is not as bad as most people make it out to be. Yeah. What I, type of entrepreneur are you? It's a bloody good point that we're landing on here because I, not only because I write about this at length and nauseam in the book, but it's an, an important thing to get clear on. Do you know what I mean? Because like you can just run a hair salon and that's fine. Mm. You know, you can just run like an, a company like yours. You know what I mean? Whatever size that is. How many companies? Um, so we have five employees for, Okay, now. well, yeah, exactly. But that's fine for you. Mm. For me, it's like I'm curious about where, how big I can build it. Mm. You know what I mean? And maybe that will require an in, taking an investor. I don't know. Mm. I'd prefer to bootstrap the thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Obviously, because equity yeah. is the most expensive form of financing. But, but I think to be clear right up front around, like to your point, why? Like, why do you want to build that thing? Mm. You know, and because it's the it's the narrative that this is the one of my biggest bugbears about the startup scene. It's that there's the Silicon Valley narrative that says that if you don't take you know money and you don't get to like then if you don't build the next Uber or if you you know what I mean like you, you, you you're, sh you're not good enough. There on the big you know in the glass windows and the yeah you're not good enough. Mm. If you're not if you don't build a big business that's not good enough and that's actually also a complete falsification of the truth. Yeah. The truth is that you should build whatever makes you happy and affords you the lifestyle that you need. Exactly. I, I, I um, identify entrepreneurship or the definition for me about entrepreneurship is being able to fund your dreams. Mm. Like what is your dream? Being resourceful, finding ways to fund that. And if your dream is to go to Mars, then you're going to need to build Raise resources to, to do that. <laughs> if your dream is going to London – then that's what you're going to need. If your dream is going to Cape Town, uh, mm. you know, that's what you need. And, and a lot of entrepreneurs, we, are, we have such a diverse country with a lot of entrepreneurs at different stages. But the one guy going to Cape Town 
isn't less of a success than the guy going to Mars mm. because that was what his dream was. And he was able to get the resources and be the entrepreneur to enable himself to do that, mm. to achieve his dream. How do you work that shit out? Because a lot of young aspiring entrepreneurs, old ones, young ones, whatever, a lot of people in general don't know what they want. Mm. They don't. They think they know what they want. And this is the thing. So like, you know, I, what I said right in the beginning of the show was like, you know, when you're when you're a first time founder, never started a business before, you're 18 years old, or in your case, 16 or whatever, like you're chasing the cash. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I'm gonna, I want to be a millionaire, and then you become a millionaire, and you realize that actually you're not happy. It didn't mean anything for you, like not Ferrari four eight four five eight Spider Mercedes CLA, CLA, whatever you know, AMG or CL sixty three AMG, like whatever like it's mm. it's just stuff it's not going to fulfill you so then you need to sit, ask the question well what 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 vision for my life do you want you paint a vision just you know put the broad brush strokes mm. on like you like you have a blank canvas and you can paint whatever the fuck you want to paint on that thing and then you got to say to yourself well how do i get there mm. right but but the thing for me it's like you got to be very clear around the material versus the spiritual and the, and the, what i mean by that is contribution Right, like hence why you're doing this thing. Because I imagine when you got to your million, you were like, "Well, hey, it doesn't make me as happy as making getting doing a talk in front of a bunch of kids." Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah. Look, when when I got there, people started asking me all the time. They said, "Albert, you're telling me about all of these properties. You're telling me about these businesses. I wish someone would have told me this when I was 22." Mm -hmm. And then I just said, "Look." I'm going to take this responsibility on myself and I'm going to do that. And I wrote the book and the initial idea was just to, I, I wrote a hundred, I printed a hundred copies that no editing. I just wrote it as is. And I printed a hundred <laughs> copies just to make a difference in my community with the schools around in my area. And then the thing just blew up. Hmm. And before we knew it, we were on in, in newspapers, on radio stations, on TV. And then the school started ca calling across the country and we said, well, let's get in the car and go. Mm -hmm. So Nicole and I got in the car and we just drove mm -hmm. and we just went to all of these schools giving back. And that is, like you said, that is where the real value came when I was like, wow, you know, I have a deep desire to, to change these people's lives and enable them with these financial concepts mm -hmm. so they can make a difference in their life so they can enable themselves to achieve their dreams as well. Mm. Because our parents don't teach us these things, school don't teach us these things, someone needs to stand up and go and do it. Mm. Have you read a book by Robin Sharma called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari? No. You should read that book, because it's basically all about what, it's, what we're saying. Mm. You know, and like, I, I mean, it's come up on the show countless times. It's like, not one, like I always ask, and I'll ask you at the end of the show, don't answer now, but like, why do you do what you do? And, and, and you know, it's all, and don't, change your fucking answer either now but uh, <laughs> now time but, to think. <laughs> yeah but it's like why do you do what you do and you know what not a single person has ever said no it's about the cash man mm. yeah it's never about the cash but, it's but, never and it's not about the cars and it's not about the bling but it's not wrong so it's also not wrong so your dream can change my dream That's started it. with with having a bike mm. so it was about getting a bike yeah. Then it changed to becoming financially independent, the cash, right? The money. Mm. And, and then when I got the houses and became financially independent, it changed again to saying, look, now I want to make a difference in South Africa. Mm. So, so I, I would, I wouldn't discourage people from going for the beach house and the car and the things. Cause that, if that's your dream at that stage, great. Go for it. Take action. Start doing something. Start making the money. Start that thing that you want to go. Whatever your dream is. Your, if your dream is to tour the world, see the countries, save penguins in Antarctica, you know, buy a Ferrari or some, whatever it is, just go for it and, and take action. Like Steve Jobs says, the dots will connect looking backwards. So you just need to go for whatever dream you have right now, mm -hmm. even if it's material or altruistic or whatever. And when you get there, mm -hmm you'll see how the dots connect mm. and then your dream might change completely. <clears throat> well, it does. Like, mm. yeah, it absolutely does. But I guess, I suppose, whatever, however it changes, because you don't know, like, but the only thing that's true is that it will change mm. at some point, you know, unless you're like a listed company and generally it's like you got to go and do that thing. <laughs> but, um, but, um, but you need to, I guess the point is like, you got to be clear on what motivates you versus what makes you fulfilled. Mm. Right. And being clear on what those two things are. So I'm saying I am motivated for the Ferrari 458 Spider. But what really fulfills me is growing people. 
Mm. You know what I mean? And be, and creating the balance around those two things. Mm. Because if I only chase that Ferrari 458 Spider, that's fine, but I'm not going to be happy. Do you see what I'm saying? And it's about, it's like if you imagine the world of an entrepreneur as a wheel and you, you got to have all the spokes in place. You got to have your motivation in place, understand what fulfills you. You got to have key relationships with people, mentors. Mm. You got to have cash flow. You got to have a proven product. You got to have all these different things in the spoke of the wheel. And once you, and then when, when it breaks, you got to, and, or when it changes, you, you got to you swap to out that spoke. All those spokes, yeah. Otherwise, the wheel falls over. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But I don't, I don't think, especially guys that start out, mm. don't worry too much about figuring it all out in the future, knowing exactly. No, you'll never know that. What you're going because because <laughs> I think too many people break their brains about it. They're, they're like thinking about, oh, what's my dream? Where do I want to end up? You know, take what you're excited about right now. Take mm. what you mm. are dreaming about right now, and just take action and go for it. You only have today, so just. Yeah. work today as hard as possible just yeah. just start it's like exactly. if you don't know what to do just start mm. just make a decision do something because yeah. i think that like you know i would say a very large proportion of people that don't start businesses is because they're over analyzed they're over plan mm. it's like where you're not gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna start a shoe business you're not gonna be a shoe business in six months you're gonna be a different business you're gonna be like a design business for shoes because it, you just don't know what the market's gonna change. dictate right and and you'll find out what the spokes are that you need mm. as you go along you'll see who you have to network with you'll see who you have to have as your mentors and all of these things you'll find out which ones to put in and which ones to take out as you go along mm. so um quincy here has two very insightful questions four really four. holy shit wow dude it's the Quincy Jones Show. Q and A. <laughs> Hi, how about you doing? Good, good. And you? I'm good. So I've got a lot of questions. Um, so I want to become a billionaire one day. Yeah. So a lot of people always tell me that it's a bit unrealistic. Unashamedly. <laughs> okay, so I want to know, um, so what advice would you give to like a lot of people our age in the 20s? Because obviously we have like a lot of social media pressure on the internet these days where we go through stages of comparison where we compare ourselves. Like some people might compare themselves to you and be like, Oh my gosh, mm. he's a millionaire 22 and I'm this at 25. So how, what's your, what's your advice for that? So, so it's the general advice, like don't compare yourself to other people. I think we've, we've got, we've been in this habit to say that, look, um, Oh yeah, he's, he's on holiday. He's now traveling there. He's now, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And I think we, we worry too much about the end product. We look at entrepreneurs. I, 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 I watched a talk of Marinus Bredrick the other day and he said, you look at these, uh, entrepreneurs that, that's on the covers of magazines and they're driving Ferraris and all these things. And you compare yourself to them, to the end product. But where were they when they were 22, when they were 25, right? Uh, when they were your age, those billionaires, like Robert Kiyosaki bought his first property at 29, right? Mm. I mean, where were they when they were your age? So, so don't compare yourself to the end product the whole time. What's your dream? What's your passion? Where do you want to go? And you need to accept that some people might start the race before you. Mm. I started my first business when I was 10 years old. I mean, if, if, if you're starting your first business today, obviously there's a lot of experience and lessons that you still have to go through. But I think, um, Compare yourself to where you are, where you want to go, and measure yourself to your dream. And accept that there's people that's ahead of you in the race, but you can't compare yourself to the end product of their lives. Do you ever think you, we could reach like a state of absolute where you don't compare yourself to anyone? Like, do you ever think that's possible? Yeah. I, I think your brain is wired to compare. Mm. Um, it's wired to say, look, I want that and I don't want that. And, but, but you need to just be, be mindful of, of what you are thinking and mindful of where your mind is at. It's, it's very difficult when you walk past someone and you see, Oh, look at that fancy car that they have. And yeah. you know, you can also buy that fancy car, but you need to say no, because I need to look at my future where I want to be. And if I want to get there, I'll rather put this money in the next property. Um, but I can buy that car right now, but then I'm, I'm going to take a long way to get back to where I want to be. So focus on, on your, your end destination. Why do you want to be a billionaire? Uh, interesting question. Um, Thanks. I want to be a, become a billionaire because I really want to create opportunity in specifically this country. 
So they're like, obviously, we know that a lot of young people in this country obviously go overseas because there's greater opportunities there, not just financially, but even like creatively and in terms of growth. So I want to bring that opportunity and actually create it here. Can't you do it with a thousand bucks? Oh, I've got like really Can't big goals. Can't you do goals. it with a hundred, hundred rand? Like I'm asking the question oh. because a lot of people think I need to be a millionaire. I need to be a billionaire. I need to make a hundred thousand a month. I need to make um, uh, 500,000 a month to do this. But what are you doing with your 10 rand now and with your hundred rand and with your thousand? You can create an opportunity for one person with a hundred bucks. So you don't need the billion before you can start doing this oh. or no money. Yeah. Or no money. Yeah. You know? Um, like money is just a, like for me, it, it's a thing, you know, like I've said this before on the show. It's like when you, when you make money, you buy dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> you, you really do. Like you just fucking like, it's just insane because you've never had it. And then once you have it and you spend it on the dumb shit, then you realize, okay, well maybe there's, there's, there's other ways to make a difference. So like you can just give your time which is one of your most valuable asset, by the way, that's in your freedom. Yeah. Money is not really important. Money actually technically is worthless. It's just paper. It's not backed by anything. It's the fiat financial system. So you can have a billion of fuck all because that's actually what you're asking. That's what you're pursuing is a billion of fuck all. What you're actually trying to get after is influence, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's Basically. what you need. Right, you can bank influence. But here's my thing. I, I like I don't want to convince people that this I I mean, obviously you have to convince people that this idea is gonna work. I don't wanna get to that state where I just chase off the influence and try to convince you. I'd rather just actually make it and show you that it yeah, works. Do it. Yeah, well then do that. Start start doing it today. Okay. But to be clear around it's it's about how do you affect how do you positively you need to change the narrative from a number from I want a billion x or rand or whatever so that i can make a difference what you what your goal should be is how do i affect or positively affect the lives of a billion people mm. see questions you know i write about this also in the book funny enough is all about how questions dictate and govern our lives mm. massively way more than i think we give it credit for like there's that's why i asked you what was the one question mm. in your head at the time because i'm trying to figure out well and that's the same thing for me it's like how do i build a monster business right but i'm not chasing money i'm in, I'm chasing scale. And so it's about the question, which should be around how do you positively influence a, 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 you know, a billion people? Because if you do that, you will be a billionaire anyway. Yeah. Right? Okay, so my next question um, relates, this, both of you can answer this. So it's relating to more to time, like you said. Time is the most valuable asset. Do you ever believe in dropping certain business ideas you might have because you might have not enough time in the future. All, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like you have to, like even if you you're really, really passionate about them though. You you can you can ask Nicole, like I am an entrepreneur. So whenever something good comes, uh, you're like, oh, I want to get into this business as well. Yeah. And then and then something else, I want to get into that business as well. But but you need to decide like what's what is the key things that's gonna get you to your end destination and focus on those things. Like I said in, uh, earlier, I, I had to downscale to only do three key things that I believe is going to get me there. And some of the other lucrative opportunities that looks nice, re remember any business is basically a full-time endeavor. It's going to take hard work and grind to make anyone work. So putting 20 of them on your plate is, yeah. Put them on a list, but pick one. Yeah. You know, because it's, uh, yeah, just one, man. I tell you, because like, um, I'm probably going to lose a staff member at the end of this conversation, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it's, but it's, it's easy. You know, when you, when you're thinking entrepreneurially and you have an entrepreneurial mindset, you, it's very easy and quick to be romanticized by the new shiny thing, mm -hmm. you know? And so you define yourself and your business more so by what you say no to, not what you say yes to. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we don't do automotive. We don't do financial services, insurance, or any other fucking company except for technology, that's what's led us to scale. The other thing about startups is that most of them start from indigestion because they take on too much stuff. Mm. And so how do you prioritize? So, even, I mean, it literally kills businesses, this idea of not, if you're not laser focused on a single problem and, and, and if you're not falling in love with that problem over and over and over again, 
Like that's really where passion comes from. That's where drive and motivation comes from. That's where your decision making comes from. It's like the smaller, this is what it, uh, is in the book Niche Down by Chris, is that, you know, when you laser focused, everything becomes clear. Your narrative, your story, your customer, your price points, your competition, everything becomes clear. Also, you can start to own stuff, you know? On the other side of the coin, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs that's, that's up there will always tell you focus on one thing only. But if you go back into their stories, a lot of them had a few different things in the beginning to, to, to see which one worked. Um, I did, I did a product based company. I didn't like it. So then I moved to service based company. I like that more. So in the beginning, try a few things. Those things you have on your list, try them, see which one you like, which one works, what type of entrepreneur are you? And then, then if, if one of them takes, uh, you'll make the one take that you like the most anyway. And then you go with that one. But in the beginning, it's not wrong to have a few different ones to learn some lessons and, and find out what you like as an entrepreneur. Okay. So, yeah. Great points. Okay. Uh, last question. So you also mentioned taking in a lot of information, reading books, watching podcasts, mm-hmm. and I agree with that. But when do you decide to like actually stop taking in information and actually do something? Like, how do you know? That I've consumed too much now. You, you never stop consuming. Mm. So it's never, you, you always keep consuming more, but you don't thinking you're going to consume a lot of content and then start. That's also the wrong type of thinking. Mm. As soon as you start consuming content, you start already. Okay. Um, I think the best way to learn as an entrepreneur is to learn, implement, learn, implement, learn, implement. So as you're reading the book, mm. start your business and then you know, as you learn from your business, the stuff in the book will also make more sense. So c- continuous self-improvement, continuous uh, intake of, of knowledge and content, but also continuous starting. So don't wait after you've read a few books to start. Start immediately, but also don't stop taking in content. Yeah. So there's a saying there. It's like um, the smart man learns something new every day, but the wise man unlearns something new. To remain relevant, and that's especially true with you know the exponential world we're going to be inheriting, or that we have inherited already, I suppose. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's about again decision making. If you're if you have shitty information available to you, you're going to make poor decisions. If you have great information, great perspective, great decisions, great results. But um, yeah, I hundred percent agree with you. Like you never ever stop learning. You can't. Yeah, it's like because your business will change. You're going to grow. You're going to looking at personal stuff. You know how to overcome the fear of failure on like month one, but on month six, you're looking at, well, confidence and leadership. You know what I'm saying? So you never really stop. You shouldn't really stop. And and if you want to become the best entrepreneur in the world, then just go into a bookstore and look at the business section. And then you'll see how many books there are from all of the great entrepreneurs in the world. And if you've only read like a quarter of them, then you still have a long way to go. And I always view my mind as like a library. Just how many information and books are in there that I can fall back on to extract knowledge in the moment when I need it. So if you can put the whole library in there, then awesome. <laughs> so just keep on going. Yeah, and you, you yeah know. that's all. Thanks. Okay. Okay, dude. So uh, just a couple more questions and then, um, and then kind of let's, let's wrap up. I mean, You've clearly now, you know, um, done a lot for the tender age of 26. Um, what motivates you today? Uh, the, 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 the look on a child's face when I teach them these things. That's what motivates me every day. That's what, what drives me now. It drives me to grow my property business and my gas business so I can get more money to, to go out and, and change more more uh, lives mm. of the youth I, I think it's just i resonate with them because i grew up in a household where i didn't know that the, these things were possible like when you're small you look at your dad and your mom and your family and you think that's what life is that's what the world is that that's what's what's possible and it's very 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 hard to to change your mind around it to say look this is not necessary how you should live life and when I go around and, te- and teach these kids and inspire them and tell them, look, it is possible and this is an option and this is where you start to do it. When that light bulb goes on, when that switch happens, mm. it's, it's, just, it's just amazing. So you can so, actually see this happen. I mean, you stand in front of a school of 2,000 kids and you speak to them and you tell them your story and 
here and there you'll see like there there it goes and there it goes and mm. even if it's just 10 that you see on the day in in, in the crowd of 1400 or whatever that that really makes a difference that makes all of this worthwhile mm. and um what would you there's a lot of talk about you know south africa's economy and how you know smes and entrepreneurs are like the the only thing that will fix that and mm. you know we need more entrepreneurs and blah 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 and you know half of those we're going to fail and whatever like look kn knowing what you know and having had the experience that you've had if there was one thing I know it's hard to choose one thing, but if there was one thing that, you know, as a community of entrepreneurs, we could all do more of mm. to help enable a better future in life for all South Africans, what would that be? Tell your story. I, I'm, I meet, I meet, <laughs> so I'm story. See what I'm saying? I meet so many entrepreneurs. Um, that's, 40 years, 50 years in business. The other day I met an entrepreneur that had a family business for three generations. I mean, and I spent a half an hour or an hour with that guy and he told me his story. And I meet so many older entrepreneurs with experience that tells you their stories. And the youth needs to hear these stories. We need more of these books. We need these big guys um, telling their stories to the youth. And and that is where the where the where the knowledge can be carried over. That's what's, that's what I think the community of entrepreneurs can make the biggest difference with mm -hmm. is if this community tells the story about their failures, about their successes. And so that the, the new generations can hear these stories uh, and it can encourage them. It can teach them. It can forewarn them. And I think that can make the biggest difference. So it's the main reason why I do the show to mm -hmm. have you know, guests come on the show and basically have a yarn mm, you know express awesome. their point of view of what's their story and what they've learned and stuff like that because because the media shapes a perspective for you which isn't real and and the <laughs> the youth is so negative if you go to schools you'll you'll see they don't think there's a there's opportunity in south africa they don't, they don't think there's a future here um if you ask them what their dreams are they'll say i want to become a doctor in london i want to become a business owner in new york like they have this idea that success is somewhere else mm. and i think if if the entrepreneurs that are successful in south africa starts telling these stories and tell them like look this is what i'm doing in south africa i'm doing it right here then it can start changing that perspective and say look there is opportunity here we can do this here and we don't have to think of this airy fairy international thing mm. uh, just just tell your story. If you have a big business, if you have a small business, just go back to your community where you came from and tell them and share that. Dude, love that shit. Last question. Why do you do what you do? What gets you out of bed in the morning? So basically about what we just talked about now, what gets me out of bed in the morning is I want to enable every kid in South Africa to get the financial education that they need to make their dreams come true. Imagine if 30% of matriculants today didn't have financial or time constraints. We'll see more Kevin Andersons representing us at Wimbledon. We'll see more inventors. We'll see more Elon Musks. We'll see all of that because there's so many kids giving up their dreams because they have to take a day job to put food on the table. So why? I want to help every kid in South Africa get the financial education that they need to help them, enable them to achieve their dreams. Albert Van Veek, everybody. Awesome, thank you.